Welcome back, Econ 104, Introduction to Macroeconomics. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at primarily growth and inequality. Really what this is coming down to is we're going to be taking a look at essentially the pros and cons, the goods and the bads of economic growth, and as well as taking a look at inequality, some sources, some causes of inequality, and then some models, or not really models, but rather metrics which we can use to measure how unequal or how equal a society or an economy is. So let's jump over. Let's take a look at that to start off. Let's take a look at just generically these pros and these cons of economic growth. So starting off is kind of our pros of economic growth. We'll go pros of growth. So our first one is that as we engage in economic growth, we tend to have higher incomes. We have a rise in living standards. We have higher quality of life, higher living standards. We typically live longer. We typically live healthier. We have higher access to caloric foods to not starve, right? To not have famine and the like. So typically economic growth results in higher living standards. This, this is really our big pro. And this, it seems like, okay, one point, that's it. This is a massive, this is a massive positive thing with growth is that rising living standards, better health, better, li better livelihoods, better lives. So not to be underrated is just, hey, am I gonna summarize this with one pro to growth? Even if I did, this is a massive, a massive pro for economic growth to happen. For cons, what do we have for economic, the cons of economic growth? So that is the negatives, the downsides of growth. Well, okay. First one is that economic growth is often seen as a rising tide, right? So as the rising tide goes up, it's like, okay, a rising tide brings up all boats. Ah, uh, that's not necessarily the case. And that is that we can say that a growing economy, a growing economy is a changing economy. And the skills that you need to be relevant in one year may make you completely irrelevant in another year. And this becomes problematic because, well, what skills do you need? What skills are going to be relevant five years from now? Those of you just starting off with your degree, maybe it's a four or five year degree, right? What skills are you going to need in five years in order to be employable? Do we know what the economy looks like in five years? Right? The skills needed five years ago don't necessarily translate into the skills needed five years from now. The problem with this especially is that, hey, as the economy grows, as certain skills that were once relevant now become irrelevant, certain workers are laid off. As those workers are laid off, they lose out on income. They have to retrain in order to re-enter the economy. As they aim to retrain, they're looking, okay, what skills do I need to be rehirable in five years' time? Well, what looks like might be a relevant skill today might actually now become irrelevant again in another five years. So for some people, they get stuck in this trap of irrelevance, which becomes problematic, right? So that is, as the economy grows, the economy changes, certain people get left behind. And as those people get left behind, well, sure, wages are growing, average incomes are growing, but if you're unemployed, if you don't have a wage, everything's just growing, everything's expanding, everything's costing more, and you still have nothing. And so you get increasing inequality at times with this. So a growing economy can be a change in income. What I want to then add is that, okay, we have this adding inequality to this growing change of economy. Certain people are left behind. I want to go back and I want to add a pro now. And that is with the context of this guy, we can say that in a growing economy, distribution, or rather, rather than distribution, we should say redistribution is easier. 
And that is, it is easier for a government to make a policy to redistribute wealth, to redistribute income from the top to the bottom, if the top's income is expected to keep growing. If the top is expecting that, hey, we're going to continue to see income growths, well, I'm not going to be happy that the government's taking some away from me, but that's uh, not terrible because in the end of the day, I'm still expecting to have more next year than I have this year. So, okay, sure, we'll give the government a little bit of this to redistribute to the bottom. And this helps with the whole inequality. This helps to provide programs to provide subsidized education so that those who are rendered irrelevant are able to retrain, are able to re-enter and re-engage in the economy. So our first kind of con, our first kind of problem, and then attached to that, another pro. Another problem with economic growth is often what we will say is that there's no free lunch. That is, you cannot just get a more output just magically. In order to get more output, you need to utilize more inputs. You need to utilize more raw resources. As you utilize more raw resources, you're utilizing, you're using up those resources. That is, you're cutting down more trees. You're burning more oil. You're utilizing, you're ripping apart more land to get at the coal, to get at the other natural resources that lay buried. So that is, we could have a boom in economic growth by logging down all of our forests today, right? Boom, all of a sudden we produce a ton of lumber. Great, awesome. At what cost, right? You can't just get more output without utilizing more inputs. Now, this is where I was saying in a previous video that technology has shown to be our key driver of economic growth. And the reason behind that being, the big reason behind that is that, hey, with new technologies, we've been able to produce more stuff with fewer and fewer inputs, right? So we've been able to use wood more efficiently. We've been able to use metal more efficiently. We've been able to use energy more efficiently. New technologies have made that possible. But typically speaking, there's no such thing as free lunch. If you want more output, you need to utilize more inputs. So just kind of a brief look. There's some good things with economic growth. There's some bad parts with economic growth, being the environmental degradation, being the potential for growing income inequality, the growing gap between the rich and the poor. Let's kind of go and we'll expand upon that. We'll spend the rest of this time kind of taking a look at some benefits as we progress up GDP. We'll take a look at, hey, yeah, we have some bad parts with GDP growth, but GDP growth really is good. And then we'll take a look at really taking a look at this inequality. So let's talk about kind of the stages of GDP growth, the stages of this. And really, I shouldn't be saying GDP growth. I'm really meaning GDP per capita, real GDP per capita. And if we wanted to think about it, real GDP per capita kind of has been witnessed to go through the following stages. So let's go real GDP per capita and I'm not going to put actual hard numbers to this we're just going to kind of view it and we'll go over time or really there's going to be different stages and we can imagine real GDP per capita is growing if we wanted to break it up into some stages we would have a really low level of real GDP per capita that is we have a really low we have very limited command of our resources at this point here, when we have a low level of real GDP per capita, our focus is on subsistence, right? It's sustenance living. Can I grow enough to feed me today? Can I get enough heat to heat me today? Can I get enough income so that I can just take care of today's needs? I'm not interested in my wants. I'm not interested in my luxuries. Heck, I'm not interested in environmental degradation. I don't care what the environmental impacts might be on my children if I'm starving today. So what we witness in these low levels of real GDP per capita is that our expenditures primarily are on food, shelter, and security. Our basic human needs, our basic things to keep us alive. As we move up to higher levels of income, that is, we can call this one here kind of a medium or a mid-level income. 
as we move up to this, we now have more resources available to us. We have a larger command of our resources, our food, shelter, and our security. They're now accounted for. They're now okay. Now, all of a sudden, we can shift our focus into making our lives easier. And that is in these mid areas of real GDP per capita, what we begin to witness is we begin to witness, we begin to spend more of our money, more of our resources on the purchase of durables. And these durables are things like automobiles, transportation, in order to be able to get us easily to and from work. We see that we start to witness um, the purchase of dishwashers, of washing machines, dryers, these extra kind of tools, pieces of capital to do work for us to free up our time to either work or to begin to enjoy leisure. So we begin to witness this movement of starting to offsource some of our own personal labor onto capital. As our income continues to grow, as we get into a high level of GDP per capita, we tend to witness a movement towards a service economy. That is, we find that most of our expenditure, most of our money at this high level of GDP per capita, well, what's happened? Our food, our shelter, and our security, these are almost taken for granted. These can be easily met. Durables, again, these are easily provided for us. Most of our expenditure in this case here goes towards service, towards paying other people to do tasks for us that we don't want to. And this is truthfully where we're at. We're in a service culture, we're in a service economy here in North America, here in most of the Western world. We pay for banking services, we pay for yard work, we pay for legal advice, we pay for internet services. All of these services, all of this is other people providing this service for us. And as we get to this higher level of GDP, this higher level of GDP per capita rather, we have all of our basic necessities being met. We now start paying extra amounts to get other people to do the things that we're not necessarily good at or the things that we don't necessarily enjoy. By paying them to do it, that gives us more time for leisure. That leisure is arguably really what we want in life is more time for leisure, more time for us to enjoy the things that we enjoy. And at this higher level of GDP per capita, that's where our money tends to go. So hence, what we want to see, especially in developing countries, especially when we look at countries or regions really hit hard with poverty, we want to grow, we want to really encourage growth, especially from low to medium. That's a huge increase in quality of life. And then very similarly as well, from medium to high income levels. As we shift up there, really high, much higher quality of life, much higher standards of living. So one of the big kind of benefits of economic growth, one of the big pushes for economic growth is to have a so-called convergence of global economies in this high level of GDP per capita, such that food, shelter, security is easily satisfied. A lot of our work is taken care of by capital, by our durables available to us, and we can utilize our income to pay others to do the stuff that we don't want to do thereby freeing up our time, freeing up our efforts to devote to what we're good at, what we enjoy, and making the most out of life. So arguably as real GDP per capita goes up, so does enjoyment, so does happiness, so does standard of living. Of course, there's lots of debate and lots that you can cringe and fight back at that, of course. Okay, well, let's go, let's move on from this and let's talk about the cons and let's talk about inequality in specific. So let's take a look at that. Let's keep in mind, we're going to be taking a look at inequality and let's talk about this whole measure of real GDP per capita. What we're doing to get this is we're taking the value of real GDP within a nation and we're just dividing it by the number of people. And what this gives us is essentially the average income or the average output or the average expenditure within a nation, right? Given that we said, hey, GDP is synonymously income expenditure output, we can think of it in any of these kind of ways. Well, keep in mind that if it's an average, we can actually have same levels of GDP per capita with grossly different results. And to kind of show you an example of that, let's take a look at two different countries. We'll take a look at country one, 
such that we have, let's just say, two people. We have person A and we have person B. Person A earns 50000 a year. Person B earns 50000 a year. What's our total income within this nation? 100000 What is our income per person? That is, what is our GDP per capita? Well, 100000 divided by the two people. We would have GDP per capita of 50000 Hey, that's a pretty fair, that's a pretty equal society. Well, let's take a look at another one. Let's take a look at country two. Okay, country two, again, we'll just simplify. We'll say there's two people. Person A, person A makes 90000 a year. Person B, person B makes 10000 a year. Together, what's this economy's uh, total income, total output, total expenditure? 100000 what is our GDP per capita again? Well, 100,000 divided by the two people, 50,000. So what we just witnessed is we witnessed two countries, each with a GDP per capita of 50,000, but yet the makeup of individuals within the economy, the amount of money earned by individuals in reality is very, very different. In country two, we have a much more unequal income distribution in country A, we have a very equal income distribution. So keep that in mind. Real GDP per capita is a measure of average income. It doesn't tell us about the distribution of incomes. It could be very unequal or it could be very equal. It's just one metric. It does not tell us the full story. And then, right, keep in mind, as we talked about, Growing economies or changing economies, typically the faster an economy grows, ultimately we tend to, and not always, sometimes we have really good government policies that are focused on equality, but often a growing, changing economy will result in increasing income inequality. For those interested in reading about this more, a uh, current author, French author, who's doing a lot of interesting research on inequality, Thomas Piketty. Uh, seminal work is Capital in the 21st Century. Uh, capital in the 21st Century. There we go. What Thomas Piketty's main kind of thesis is as he works through it, if you want me to summarize the book for you, it's a massive book if you're ever interested to read it. Uh, pretty plain language. It's actually written for the masses. Essentially, Piketty's main argument is that if your real return on capital is greater than the growth rate of the economy, so your real return on capital, that is the real return that you get on your investments, if that's greater than the growth rate of the economy, wealth will tend to pool at the top. If the real return on your investments is less than the growth rate, that is if the economy is growing faster, then you will tend to have a more equally distributed society. You'll have wealth more equally distributed amongst everybody. What Thomas Piketty shows is that in a lot of countries that are facing growing inequality, we witness this. We witness that the return on assets is greater than the growth of the economy. So those who have money, their money keeps growing. Those who don't have money, well, they're growing at the rate of economic growth, which is significantly slower. So you have a two-track economy, higher wealth from those who already have wealth, and lower wealth from those who are hoping for economic growth. So the comparison, the outline between those two, at least a theory that has been proposed within the last decade to explain growing inequality. Okay, if real GDP per capita is a good measure of standard of living across an economy on whole, but not a good measure of equality or inequality, that is, it says nothing at all about equality or inequality, how can we determine the level of equality within a nation? And what we're going to look at is two different methods, two different metrics to look at that. The first being what is known as a Lorenz curve. And a Lorenz curve looks like such. 
we have a graph and we would look at the vertical axes as the the cumulative percent of income going from zero to 100 percent right so hey this here accounts for all the income in a nation none of the income in a nation. the horizontal axes this would be the cumulative percent of oh i just did income sorry the cumulative percent of the population such that what we would do is we draw a 45 degree line going up such that across this line would be complete equality right again zero to a hundred percent and right why would that line be exact equality well you could have a point saying hey 50 percent of the population earns 50 percent of the income right so 50 50 so your bottom 50 percent earns 50 percent of the income so hey along that line we have an equal income distribution as we deviate from that line we end up having increasing inequality so if we want to take a look at it for example freehand this it won't be exact but roughly if we want to take a look at canada canada's lawrence curve looks something like this uh starting at about 20 ish percent it's gonna go something like that where if we want to take a look at that specific point right here the bottom 50% earn about 25% of the nation's income. So that is the bottom half of our population earns only a quarter of the nation's income. The other 75% of the nation's income is shared by this top 50%. So bit of income inequality going on here. This as I've drawn it, however, is a pre-tax Lorenz curve. Right? This would be based off of your gross income. In Canada, we have a decent tax and transfer system where we tax the rich and we move that money, we redistribute that money to the poor. If we were to take a look at this Lawrence curve, given this redistribution, it would look more like this. Again, I'm just freehanding it. This is not exact, but the Lawrence curve moves in. And as a result, the closer in it gets, the more equal of a society we get. And I can't remember the exact number for our after tax, but essentially the big takeaway is that this 50% of our population takes home a lot higher of a percent of our income once we account for the after tax. That is, we actually have a decent process of redistributing our wealth from the rich to the poor to create a more equal society. So the Lorenz curve is one way that we can visualize this distribution of income. If we have a line that fits really close to this 45 degree, great, we have an equal society. If we have a line that varies drastically away from it, uh, we have a much more unequal society. For example, let's clean this up and let's take a look at that country two that we took a look at where, hey, one person earned 90,000 and the other person earned 10. It would look something more like this. Let's, let's take a look. So that country, that imaginary country, would have a very unequal. It would be something more like, we'd be sticking along, oh, wrong tool. Let's try that again. We'd be sticking along the bottom and then we'd be doing a sharp rise for that one person, right? That is the bottom bit of our population earns the bottom only a very little bit of the share of our nation's income this top one percent earns then all the rest of the income that is the more unequal a society is the much more flexed this curve will be being that an extremely unequal society would look like such 
right? Boom, nothing being earned by anybody. And then that top 1% earning 100% of our income. That would be an extreme, an extreme case, of course. Unlikely. Okay, so that's how we can visualize, that's how we can interpret a Lorentz curve. From a Lorentz curve, we can get another kind of outcome, another metric to measure inequality. And it's not perfect. We don't get to see really that full distribution of income like we do with the Lorentz curve, but it gives us an ability to quickly and easily compare levels of equality or inequality across nations. And that is with the Gini coefficient. So let's just quickly clean up this Lorentz curve here and let's introduce this Gini coefficient. So our Gini, sorry, Gini coefficient is measured, can be approximated using this Lorentz curve. And let's suppose that we had a Lorentz curve that looked as such. What we could do is we could, let me just use a different color for this, cut down there, so 100% of the income all the way down, we could go and we could shade in these areas. We could say, okay, this guy here, let's shade this in as yellow. And then this bottom part here, let's shade all of this in as green. Okay. So we have two different areas. We can call these areas a, nah, that doesn't really show up too well, areas A and areas B correspondingly. If we could calculate the areas underneath these, this curve, we could calculate the Gini coefficient as A all over A plus B. Okay, if we work this out, if we work that out and we get a coefficient of one, that is complete inequality. That is that last case that we took a look at that was a box, right? Where it was just like, boom, that top one person earned 100% of the income and everybody else had nothing. So one is complete inequality. On the other hand, a Gini coefficient of zero is perfect equality. That is with a Gini coefficient of zero, a 50%, the bottom 50% of the population earns 50% of the income. 75% of the population earns 75% of the income. On and on and on and on. And of course, then our Gini coefficient ranges from zero to one. The more unequal a society is, the closer to one it would be the more equal a society is, the closer to zero we would be. To give this some context, let's take a look at the Gini coefficient in Canada, the date that I was able to get good data, consistent data for, in Canada was 2013. So quite a few years old, but wanted to use 2013 because it was a year that I could break it down by province and take a look at which provinces were more versus less equal as well. So Canada on whole in 2013, we'll go Canada, had a Gini coefficient of about 0 0.319. So this is after tax. This is given our redistribution. So not a pre-tax, but a post-tax after we've redistributed wealth to the poorest in our society. So closer to zero than one, that means we're closer to equality than inequality. Within Canada though, we don't actually have that big of a gap between our worst and our best. So in 2013, if we took a look, our worst Gini coefficient, our worst Gini coefficient was Ontario. Was Ontario with a Gini coefficient of 0 0.331. The best, the best was New Brunswick. Uh, was that right? Yep, New Brunswick at 0.29. So you see a pretty narrow gap there altogether within our Canadian Gini coefficients. For those interested, here in Victoria, we're in the province of British Columbia. BC had a Gini coefficient in 2013 of 
three. So that is, we're closer to the worst in Canada than we are to the best. That is, NBC, our society would be more unequal than the Canadian national average. There's definitely better provinces in Canada with more equal societies. If you want to take a look kind of how this is moving, I don't have the data for the provinces, but I do for the country on whole. If we fast forward to 2018, the next year I could get consistent post-tax data, right, after our tax and transfer. Our Gini coefficient has moved from 0 0.319 to 2018 being 0 0.303. That is, over the last, well, in this case here, over these last five years, our economy has moved to being more equal. We've been moving towards equality. So from that stance, that's, that's a pretty good sign. That's a pretty good sign. Uh, if you want to compare and contrast that, let's take a look at the U.S. economy. So let's take a look at the Gini coefficient of the USA. So Gini coefficient of the USA, it was what you derived data for. I have 2013 again. Uh, there we go. That was for consistency. In 2013, the USA had a Gini coefficient of 0 0.48. So, hey, closer to one, that's more unequal, more inequality. That's, that's significantly higher. That's significantly higher than we have here in Canada. Within the U.S., there's quite a bit of a larger spread between all the states. If we took a look at it, the worst state was New York with a Gini coefficient of 0 0.51. The best... The best state was actually Alaska with a Gini coefficient of 0.417. So keep in mind, Alaska was their best, their most equal state. Alaska still had a lot more inequality than our best. So some comparison there. If we fast forward, I couldn't get a very similar 2018-2018 comparison, but I could get their Gini for 2019. It had stayed the same. It hasn't become more equal. It also hasn't become more unequal. So I guess that's a good thing. It stayed constant at about a Gini coefficient of point. Keep in mind, right, this Gini coefficient, this just tells us what the degree of equality, degree of inequality it doesn't really tell us about that income distribution too much, other than it's more unequal. The Lorentz curve, the Lorentz curve gives us a good idea as to what we're looking at. The Gini coefficient is just one metric summarizing this diagram. So that's really one way, the problem in some ways with that Gini coefficient. Okay, in this video, we have looked at some pros, some cons to economic growth. We have talked about GDP per capita as a measure of increasing standard of living, increasing quality of life. We have taken a look that GDP per capita comes into problems that it doesn't really measure equality. We could have two very different situations with the same GDP per capita. We then introduced this idea of measurements of inequality. We could view it using our Lorentz curve. We could also have a single metric for easy comparison across states, across time, and that would be our Gini coefficient. If you have any questions about anything we've covered in this video, please feel free to reach out to me, post in the comments below, post on D2L, or of course, feel free to send me an email. Thanks, until next time.